Okay, we're going to go to um, Southern California to Juventud Guerrera. And um, anyway, how how are you doing these days? How are you, man? I'm doing really good. We're here, yeah. with, we're here with Brian Alvarez and uh, as well. Good to hear you, man. Thanks for the interview. Oh, you're uh, you're very welcome. What have you been What have you been up to in the last couple of weeks since the deal in Australia? Well, after that happened in Australia, I've been, you know, I was trying to clear my my mind and to see to think about what I'm going to do, you know. And you know, um, well, people were really after that really getting got in contact with me really soon to to see if I can be able to work. And I said, yeah, you know, so I went to Puerto Rico. I went to do a couple of shows to UPW, and actually there's going to be another show on the 20 with UPW. So, I mean, I'm just trying to to get my, my thing clear, you know, uh, to make to make the people understand, too. Um, 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 you know, that was just a mistake to happen, but it's not the determination of my career, you know. What, I mean, do you have any explanation, I guess, as to to what happened when you were over there and what led to your problem? Um, well, in Australia, did you say? Yeah, in Australia, yeah. Okay. Well, that was really, I don't know, that was like a nightmare, man, because I didn't expect something like that happened to me, you know. And so I was really surprised, you know. I was, you know, I was just having fun with my friends, and um, just the things got out of hands, you know, and I just lost my mind. I, I didn't remember really well what happened, and, wow, I mean, that was just like a really strange um, uh, situation to, I, I couldn't even control, you know. So, well, you know, that was really sad for me, but uh, anyway, you know, it's just like every, everybody, it's gotta, now i got to do my best and, and and to try to do my best, you know, to get back in the business and to get back with the public and and to get the loose again, to get the juice again, you know. Is is there anything like, like at what point do you kind of like not remember what happened and then did, was there a point where whatever happened like kind of wore off and all of a sudden you were like, what were your I thoughts when it all wore off and what did you did you could you remember everything or? No, I didn't remember everything. I just I. I don't remember when they say I pull my pants uh, down. I didn't remember that. That was the point until uh, when I lost my mind. And uh, and well, that was that was, that was about it. When uh, when I was talking with my friend with Carlos and Ray, I remember part of that. But after that, they say I was I, I just went crazy. And and I assume I did, you know, because I uh, I mean I was under influence of some some. Some uh, well, some crazy stuff that they give it to me, and I didn't. I should not take it, you know, because I was I was in a, another country, and that was just a strange, really strange stuff. And did you like, like you, when you kind of like remember it? Were you like, were you like in uh, in jail, or was it later than that, or before that, or? Yeah. Do you remember like I the was, police coming? Nah, n yeah, I I kind of remember that, but not really well, you know, because I. Everything that was just, uh, I thought that was kind of in a, in a dream, you know. I didn't realize that was real. So, so when I wake up in the middle of the of of the jail, supposedly, uh, well, I was like really shocked, you know. I was completely shocked, and I and I, well, I was just praying, you know, to nothing bad happen to me, you know. Now, um, we should like get so. So then, anyway, you you you, you got out and uh, basically you were you were sent home, and yeah. then you got the word that you were being terminated. Do you have any like thoughts as far as you know you you've been with the company for several years and thought maybe maybe unfair or did you just kind of I mean what were your thoughts that you kind of like um, you know all of a sudden like out of nowhere it's kind of like your world crumbled. Well, actually, um, you know, when I when they let me go, when they let when they let me go, I asked my lawyer, the lawyer today gave do they find for me, you know, what is the situation? Can I still be able to work and do the and finish the tour? And they say, yeah, just you need to talk with your company, and you you, you 
just need to tell them to what they want, what they what they want to do with you. So I try to to tell them. I try to contact them and you know, Terry and uh, some of the people who was there, and um, well, they just don't let me go. They they take me straight to the plane. They say, "Kobe, you gotta go home." And I was like, "I mean, I mean, come on, give me the opportunity to be working." I mean, that was just. I know that was re- maybe just a really strange thing, but I mean, I want to finish the tour. I want I want to be working here in Australia, and I want to do. And maybe I don't know if that was wrong or bad, but I was I was just trying to do that because because. Because I asked even the police, you know, if if that was if that was really bad, you know, if I can be able. Even my lawyer told me to yeah, to, I was able to work. They they so they say no. They sent me home, and when I realized that, I realized to to, to that was that was maybe gonna be the something really bad for me. And so after a couple of days, uh, Diana Diana my just called me and they say, you know, who be you? You are you are out of the contract and uh, and so I'm sorry and I say oh my god oh, you think it was because you got so much uh, publicity on TV about it uh, maybe I think so maybe I think so you know and well the thing is too I tried to get back my job I went to Atlanta to talk with Diana and and she wasn't there so so I just I just you know I just realized too. To this, to something like that. Oh, that that was that, that was something that's gotta happen to me. I don't know why. Maybe I was the guy to to make the consequence, you know. But uh, I mean, I, I just my my soul was to in that moment to I just gotta be strong, you know. I gotta be strong like uh, like always I've been, and um, you know just. Right now, I'm just trying to get back the respect of the people, you know, because I'm not a really bad guy, you know. I'm, I'm just, I just make a mistake, just like, I'm like everybody, you know. And well, you know, it's a really bad and sad situation, you know, for a worker like me, you know. Oh yeah. Now you uh, last week went back to AAA uh, in Antonia. It's been several years since you've worked for him. How, how did that all go? That was really good, you know. Uh, that was really interesting, you know, for me because I didn't expect Antonio Antonio Peña went to the show because that was no a TV show. That was just a big show. So I was flying from Mexico and I saw Antonio Peña and he was there, you know, just to see me. So we went to Tijuana and for some reason we didn't talk, you know, we didn't have could have a good uh, conversation. So um, the next day he fly back to home. To Mexico and and, uh, and then uh, I stay here, you know, in California. So I think he wants me to work with him. He wants me to do something with the company with AAA, and uh, and maybe I do, you know. I mean, I got a lot of things to do. I mean, I, I would like to be working. My my uh, priority is to be working here in the United States, and um, and you know. With the with the same people and with the same uh, ambient, you know. I like AAA, and I, I'm I'm not saying it's bad, you know. Maybe I can go there and do really good stuff for the company too, you know. But uh, right now, um, you know, my priority is to be working here in in United States, and uh, and well, I don't know, maybe. Maybe I can do something for them too, you know. We talked a little bit about the recent stuff. Um, we want to give everyone about your your background. You actually started wrestling very very young. Your father was a, a famous pro wrestling uh, heel Rudo in uh, Mexico City, and uh, was that kind of like where you got your start? And did you also have? Um, are there other members of your family that have done wrestling? I uh, know, just my father. Yeah. Yeah. And. and uh, uh, did you start going like? Uh, did you start going to matches with your father at a very young age? Yeah, when I was really young, I used to go with my father. You know, I used to watch my father in the ring, and uh, and even when I was like six, seven years old, I used to go to the gym, and I used to train with some other uh, uh, some wrestlers. You know, and uh, I used to play with them in the gym, and 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 the father used to be the referee. So, and I got a good. I really got a good memories about it, about that, you know. 
And when they, how, you know, how old were you when you first started wrestling professionally? Uh, 16. I was getting 17. Between 16 and 17. Now, when I would have first saw you in AAA, uh, how long had you been wrestling then? When you first started being on tele getting on television in Mexico? Uh, I think 18, something like that. 18. So yeah. probably a little over a year? Uh-huh. Yeah. And how was that transition like? Because you, first year or so that you were on AAA, I mean, you went from, you went, you, you, you kind of became a big star in a hurry. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, it was really difficult for me because in the beginning I, I was trying to be a baby face because I used to have a lot of, I used to, do, I used to have, I used to, Got a lot of moves, you know, and crazy stuff in my mind, you know, to actually have. And, uh, and so that was my intention, you know, be a baby face to, and can't be flying around and do crazy parts. And, and, you know, my father was one of the biggest healers in Mexico, so he told me, you know, songs, you gotta be a, you gotta be a healer, boy. So I was like, no, man, I don't wanna do that. I mean, I'm so young and I'm, I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm really light also, you know. I, I, my way is not so, it's not so big. So let me be a baby say. And he got mad, you know, just like every father, you know. So you gotta do this because I'm this and this and that. And I was like, oh fuck, so I have to. So in the beginning, you know, in Mexico, you gotta be carry on the baby face. You gotta be a base for the baby face. So that, Teach me a lot to me, you know, teach me how to be a good heel in the beginning of my, of my career because later on I realized what is to be a baby face, you know. So I think it was good because now I got a, I got the compliment to be a, to know what is to be a heel and to know what is to be a baby face, you know. And um, the first years I was working in the in the very beginning of the of the of the programs, you know, in the very first matches. And um, with the and after maybe a year, a couple months, or maybe a year, uh, Ray Mysterio and Psychosis, they was already working almost on, on the main events at Triple A. So they gave me the opportunity because I was doing I was doing well. They gave me the opportunity to be working with them, and and from them, from there I just jump. You know, I just make a big uh, explosion and and. Ray Mysterio and myself, we start to to work again with each other, and uh, and from there we we start to to make this new generation, you know, which I call the Super Calo winners, some of those guys, you know. That was a really wild time in uh, in AAA. Uh, it was kind of like I just remember going to those shows in Tijuana and some of the other cities. It was really spectacular wrestling. Now I, I thought that you were. It, it was it was actually fortunate that you were a heel because you made such a natural opponent for Ray and you guys you know you were you were a little bit bigger than him but you weren't so you could play heel off of him but you weren't you were all you know basically his size so you could kind of fight even back and forth and uh, you know you and him had like sensational matches plus you could do the the father son uncle nephew thing yeah, you know you had yeah. great tag matches too in that in that time period yeah. Yeah, we did a couple of matches against Uncle and and a few against Father and Song in Tijuana, Mexico, and a couple of cities in Mexico, and that was really interesting, also. Now, when uh, during during this period, I mean, is there any match that you had with Ray? Because I mean, I, you had met some matches with Ray on Mexican TV. You had matches in ECW, later in WCW. You probably wrestled him, I don't know, fifty, a hundred times. Is there any one of those matches that stands out more than the rest? You know, I, I, in Mexico, there's some too. I remember when I when I we, we did a match to that was car against car in a cage, and and that was hilarious, man. I mean, we used to do a lot, a lot of spots, crazy spots with uh, from the top of the of the jail and uh, a lot of crazy Frankensteiners and a lot of suplex. You know, Japanese shows. You know, we was really, really young, and um, well, I mean, I watched that and I get excited, you know, because it's like, wow. I mean, it's it's a lot, a lot of good, good stuff, you know. Even in ECW, you know, the first matches that we had in ECW, that was really, really exciting for me until now, you know, because that was the thing to make a jump until here, you know. 
And uh, well, a couple of, a couple of good matches in WCW, but uh, I think um, you know the beginning is the best, you know. Yeah, son. What what what? I guess if you look back, is there any specific thing, or just a series of circumstances in WCW? Because you you came in, you were wrestling those same kind of matches that you had in ECW, and then um, I mean you had a, you had a lot of great matches in WCW, but at the same time, as the years went on. And did, did you feel like maybe that that like your good matches were not appreciated by management, or wasn't helping you to have good matches, or was there you know kind of that mentality that like you know you're not pushed to excel? You know, yeah, that was really really difficult in WCW. You know, in the beginning, I mean, they saw me and they they thought that every every everyone every one wrestler in Mexico is gonna be like me, so they brought like a bunch of Mexican wrestlers. And that was good for them, you know, and, 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 I mean, I mean, that was really good also for everybody and also for the American, uh, crowd, you know, because they, they could realize what is their Lucha Libre style, you know, it's, it was just, it's, it's really exciting, you know, it's really exciting and that's what the people want to see, you know, exciting, exciting, exciting things. So, so, um, I think the only bad thing with the Lucha Libre is that they don't have any, any psychology, you know, they don't know how to how to how to how to play in a match. They just been jumping around and around, and, and you know that is good and that is exciting. But it's here it, you gotta have a compliment, you know. So um, when I just started, I mean, it's, it was really, I mean, kind of because I, I, in that moment I, I couldn't even speak uh, English so so well. So I was just trying to do my best, you know. I was just trying to go outside and to do the best I can. And you know, I got a lot of good uh, um, uh, um, helping, but I got a lot of bad steps, you know, with the booking, with the bookers, and with the people. So they, they maybe they don't want to give me a real push since the beginning, you know, because maybe I was I was coming from Mexico, maybe because I was so young, or maybe because. Uh, I didn't speak English, so oh, that was a lot of circumstances today don't let me, they don't let me go through, you know, until now. So, but I mean, I think if, if you got a good mentality and if you're really a hard worker and, um, and, and if you got a lot of passion for what you do, I mean, you, you can go through, you know, I, I'm basically that's what I did. What was your first reaction when they told you they wanted to take your mask? Well, you, you're not gonna believe one thing. I just saw this match. I never see, see I never see that match. I just saw that match like two days ago. And, uh, wow, man, that was, that was one of my, I, most memorial matches that I have in mind because that was 98 and that was my first push and they told me, you know, Hubi, you wanna do this? And I was like, no, you know, I don't want to lose my mask. That's my tradition. My father's still wearing the mask, still having the mask in Mexico for maybe 20 years, and I'm going to lose my mask after a couple of years. I don't want to do that. They say, well, we are not asking you. You have to do this. And I was like, fuck, you know. I didn't know what to do, you know, but that was my first push, and I was on TV, and I was doing well, and I was having really good matches. And... uh and I, I, I mean, I just, fuck, I just went outside and do, and, and do my best, you know, and, and, um, and, and, well, I think after that, that was, that was really good actually for me and for, and for the people because I think without the mask, I can have a better contact, you know, physically and with the people, you know, with the crowd. And I think that here in America, they don't think, uh, uh, too much about the mask, you know, and 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 I realized that, and I'm happy about it, you know. I, and now I don't really care about it. I think that was a good, a good. Um, uh, besides that, I think it was good, anyways, you know. Do you think they could have done more? I mean, I remember when when you lost your mask. I think it was in San Francisco. That yeah. um, that I was thinking that it could have been it could have been built up longer and better. And I guess that's partially because you know from following Mexican wrestling and how. They can make that mask match. I mean, that's the ultimate match in Mexico, basically. I know, I know, you know. And actually, I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't know that, but uh, you know, in Mexico, you used to have 30 minutes matches, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, 
And here it's like you go outside, you you, you only have on, on live TV five minutes, six minutes, on a pay-per-view maybe 10 or 15. And, well, anyways, you know, I think the most important in a match is to have a good psychology and to make the people understand what you where you want to go, what is the point to where you do you want to make clear, you know. Did you, did you, like, what was your father's reaction when he got the word or you told him that you were going to have to lose his mask? <laughs> you know, in that moment, we didn't even spoke with each other. We, did, we used to have a little trouble, and, and, you know, just like every father in songs. And, uh, and, you know, after a couple of months, uh, I realized that he was really sad about it, you know. He was really sad because he didn't know why I did it, you know. He didn't know how it the company or how is the tradition here in America and so he was kind of sadly you know and I was and after a while he realized to that was my job that was my work and that was my career and, and he just gave me support after a while you know and right now we got a good relationship with my with my dad Going back, you know, with the, when you were a kid and everything, do you remember, like, any specific matches or, or rivals of your father? Like, um, I, I mean, I remember when I first started watching Lucha Libre and I would watch your father wrestle Santo and Octagon. And do you remember, like, further back than that? If I remember some of his matches? Like, uh, his big rivalries and things like that. Um, I mean, against another, another wrestler? Yeah, like, uh, like, you know, he used to wrestle Santo and Octagon. I mean, I remember him, you know, being, like, I'm thinking about 1989, 1990, big program with Octagon, and I remember yeah, seeing yeah. him in Japan with Santo, and, you know, always wrestling with those, with those guys especially. You know, I mean, I, I, I told this my father, you know, you know that, you know, you know what I really like now to have been working here in, in America to... If you want to get over, you gotta be a baby face. You have to be a baby face. Otherwise, it's really difficult. And he said, you know, you know, son, you're right. You know, here in Mexico, there's a couple guys just like Octagon, like Santo. They, they are not the greatest wrestlers, but like they are baby face in Mexico. You know, the people is all the time with them. You know, and and it's really difficult for a heel to get over. Even when my father got over, you know, uh, and was really respectful. But anyways, in Mexico. Um, that is the tradition, you know, and that was just one of the things that my father told me. This is from William Gallagher, who says, uh, All Japan has hired many of the luchadors that were let go by WCW. That's right, because uh, Halloween has been there, Damien's been there, Super colo has gone, and Psychosis is going in January. And would you be interested in joining them, going to All Japan? Uh, well, I, you know, I, right now I'm interested in, the, uh, of, uh, in almost everything, you know. I just... Well, need to know what is the expectation and and and, um, and what would be the result, you know, if I go there. I just want I just want to do a good thing for me, you know, and for the people, for my fans too, also. Now, a lot, a lot of people may not know, but um, now, now, you're what's what's your status? I mean, you you have a family, you have a, a young child, and um, are you basically living in Mexico City or Southern California, or you kind of go back and forth? I'm back and forth, you know, I'm back and forth because, like I told you, I'm trying to keep my name alive here. And, uh, you know, actually, I'm thinking about AAA also, you know, but I didn't know until, you know, and I didn't know nothing about it because I know WWF says to, uh, maybe they're interested in me, but not now, you know. So maybe I just got to wait, you know, and, and, and to keep my, 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 my thing clear, you know, and, and show everybody too. I'm I'm uh, I'm a straight up person, and uh, and well, that's basically it. Uh, what uh, this is from Rob Bahari, who says, uh, what did you think of of Triple A? You know, now seeing that and, and compare that to when you were there several years ago. Well, for me, it's it's, it's like. Uh, I mean, if I go back there, I really gotta, gotta, have, gotta, um, I'm gonna, I really gotta have to have a good conversation with Tonya Pena because what I wanna do is something different, you know. I, I just don't wanna go back and be one of the, uh, how, uh, one of, uh, Batos Locos or, or one of those guys, you know. I, I wanna go back maybe and I wanna do really good stuff, something to I really, I, I know I can do, you know, and I know I can, 
turned that company really well, you know, with some really good uh, ideas. And if I do that, you know, I really got going to have to spend more time in Mexico. But uh, I didn't know nothing until I spoke with him, you know, and if he's interested, and I know maybe he will, uh, maybe we can do something really good stuff, you know, for AAA. You know, because it's the same thing for AAA since a couple of years, it's the same status, and they don't, they don't, it's still good, you know, it's still maybe exciting, but they don't change, they don't have the, the, um, the um, creation that they used to have when, um, when, when Ray Mysterio and myself was there, you know. And but well, maybe Ray Mysterio is not, not going to be there, but maybe I can grab some ideas from here, you know, for, from the uh, American culture. Now, when you when you started getting to be a pretty big star in AAA, your style was not... I mean, there was a lot of Lucha Libre in your style, obviously, but you had a lot of... There was a lot of Japanese wrestling in your in your style. Was that from watching... Obviously, it's from watching videotapes. Were there any, like... Uh, Japanese, whether it be Satoru Sayama or any Japanese wrestlers that you really liked that really kind of influenced your style? Or was it maybe just Eddie, Eddie Guerrero? You know, that was a little bit of everybody, you know, but most, basically the uh, uh, Japanese, Japanese, Japanese style and also American style, you know, the American style is the psychology, how to sell, and the Japanese style is just the strongest, you know, the how to make a suplex, how to Haru and and the psychology also. All Japan, they are the best. You know, Misawa and Kawada. I mean, they are the best for me. You know, and I learned a lot from them. Also for the for for the uh, heavy heavy junior ways, You know, like um, Liger, like um, uh, Benoit, also Eddie too, also. And um, and uh, I got a lot of influence from from, the, from them. You know. And also, you know, for Tiger Mask, you know, the first one in uh, Dynamite Kids. Yeah. Now, Some of your favorite people to wrestle, both in Mexico and here in the U.S.? Uh, excuse me? Who are some of your favorite people to wrestle down in Mexico and... Uh... Uh, well, the same people down here, you know. I mean, they used to, I used to have a good... Well, actually, there's a couple guys today still in Mexico, like Winners. Now it's Abismo Negro. Uh, there's another one, too, is... Uh, he used to be, uh, uh, his Blue Panther nephew. Oh, Black and, Warrior? Uh, yeah, Black Warrior. Oh, he's super. Yeah, he's really good. And super crazy also. Yeah, oh, yeah. But, yeah, but you know, besides that, there's no really young guys, you know, like, oh, you know, they, they're, most of them, they are really like 40, 45 years old, and, you know, it's just, it's just so different, so. Well, have you seen uh, Ricky Marvin? Yeah, no, I haven't seen him, you know. I didn't know how it's him, and I don't know how it's his style. Uh, very good, very good flyer. I think he's, he's pretty yeah. young, too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What's, when you were in WCW, a lot of guys on top were older guys and slower, and they worked the American style, and... Would you have wanted to be on top and have to work with those guys, or were you happy being able to work with the light heavyweights like Jericho and Ray and Skos and everybody? You know, I think that's a good question, and 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 because you know, I really I was really interesting interesting to be working with Kevin Nash, with Booker T, uh, maybe with uh, Hogan. You know, one time I spoke with him and I told you know, and even the same thing to, the same thing to I told Kevin Nash. You know, man. If you and me, we work with each other and we do a program, not just with me, you know, with the young, like Ray Mysterio, because if you really want to work with, with us, with the young guys, you don't have an idea how over you're going to be. And he, goes, he was like, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe we will, but, uh, and he, but he, he, never, he never did it, you know. He never did something really serious about it. He was just playing around, maybe because he was afraid to, or he just don't want to put us over but that was not the fact, you know. The fact is to everybody's going to be over, you know, just because we are going to be doing something uh, together, you know, and it's going to be, that was going to be so so interesting for the people, you know, for the crowd. But they never, they never want to do it, you know. They, they are really jealous, and they just want to keep uh, his clique together, you know. They don't, they never want to, want to let somebody to pass, you know. And that was really, that was really, Observed, you know, really bad. 
did, did you get frustrated as far as in WCW when you got, like, let's say you and Billy Kidman, just as another period, you were doing some of the best matches, you were doing the best matches in the company for a while there, and yet when it was over, it's kind of like there was nothing new for him and there was nothing new for you, and, you know, it was kind of like you did all those matches and it was like you would think that it should elevate both of you and instead you just kind of stayed in the same position. Yeah, you know, we there was some point that we got really frustrated, you know, because after we have the best matches and we got the crowd, the the most excited moments in the in the in the, in the night, and so they even even they don't care, you know, they was pushing guys to they don't even. I mean, they was putting a lot of uh, money and a lot of uh, um, productions, you know, and people they do, today don't even deserve it, you know. And that was really frustrating for us. But, you know, what you can do when you are young and we're, what you can do when you have the whole company almost against you, you know. So that was just uh, maybe take the things uh, easy, you know, and, and go with the flow and, and maybe just um, catch, catch the opportunity later on, you know. Let's, let's, let's go to Vinny in New Jersey. Vinny, you're first up. Hey, guys. How you doing? Really good. How you doing? Um, how are you? I'm all right. Hoovy. Yeah. Listen, um, I'm a 20-year-old kid in college, and, uh, got the pills and everything. Don't worry about that, because it could have happened to anybody, you know? And, uh, a lot, we were just learning about that stuff, you know? We didn't, there could have been anything in that. So, it's a blessing in this guy, I think, because WCW is, they just didn't know what to do with you. They don't know what to do with anybody, <laughs> actually, but, um, yeah, just just hang in there, and if the WWF's interested in you, then just just play your cards right, and you'll get there. But I want to ask you about uh, when you your first match in WCW, um, Gene Oakland, he uh, went to interview you. Do you, anyone remember this? I went to interview you, Hoovy, and uh, he uh, said uh, you were trying to talk in Spanish. I don't think you could you could have uh, even knew you didn't know English at then. He's like, oh, know. take it somewhere else, buddy. I'm like, what a jackass that guy is. You remember it at all? Yeah, I remember. You know, that was really, I mean, I don't know how was it, but, I mean, they, I remember that was against Billy Kidman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and. And the things got they, they they got me over, but after after the match they said, you know you gotta do this with the microphone, and I was like what? <laughs> <laughs> and when they put the microphone on me, I would just speak Spanish, you know I didn't know what the, what the fuck was that, so that was really funny. And thank you for your support, man. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you all you people. And you know I'm just praying, you know, to to get back to the business, to get back on, on television, and to get to get again um uh fans happy again that's my that's my goal you, you know uh they knocked you about your mic skill when you first came in there but i remember on a thunder i think like in your book you were commentating and like who was out there the funniest thing i heard in like the longest time while watching wcw is when you said uh he said, the juice is loose. That's the real juice right there when we were with Tony. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you got heat for that? Yeah, I got a lot of heat, but I got a lot of things, you know. Uh -huh. I, got, I, got, I got a lot of good support, uh, too, you know. How did they approach you about that job? What did they tell you to do when you were out there? Nothing, man. I mean, they just told me, you know, you, wa you want to do this because I did it before to have a completely show. I did just uh, for one match. No and guidance. That, <laughs> and, after, <laughs> and, after that, <laughs> and after that match, they told me, you know, you want to do it again, and I complete the show. And I was hurt, you know. I was my after, that was after I broke my elbow. Uh, so I said, yeah, why not? So they put me in the microphone, and I was just, I was just, <laughs> I was just losing, you know. I was, <laughs> <laughs> they just got loose right there, baby. <laughs> Um, one more thing about Raw. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys touched on it before, but uh, the show seems so much more enjoyable without Triple H GH there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sick and tired of seeing him. I mean, he's uh, to me, he's he's awesome, but uh, I don't know so much of anybody. Exactly, That's true. he's a great worker. He great mic mic skills, whatever. But 
I can't stand seeing them involved in every angle. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it, too much of anyone isn't a good thing. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was kind of good to have a, a break, but I think they took too many guys off. It almost oh seemed like... yeah, Jericho wasn't there. A lot of people weren't there because uh, basically the whole thing revolved around Foley. And that was overkill. Just like, I, oh, I I think uh, we should start a word count. And see how much how many times uh, Jr. uses the word hellacious. I have like ten ten times I heard him say it <laughs> last night. I mean, he's the best broadcaster out there, but enough's enough with that word. <laughs> Well, he's true. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's true. It's true. All yeah. right. Thanks for the call, guys. <laughs> okay, you're very welcome. Um, Thank you. What do you think of some... the top guys in the WWF? I know you love The Rock. And what do you think of some of the other guys? In, in WWF? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of, a lot of good uh, people, you know, too, I can work with them and have great matches, you know, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited if they just give me the opportunity to work with one of them, no matter who, you know, I, I know I can, I can, I can burn, I can burn the house, baby. And, What's well, up? you know, I like everybody, you know, I would, I like, you know, I don't know, I mean, everybody, I mean, basically, you know. What, what, tell everyone the story about, uh, when you first met The Rock. Well, that was in uh, that was in Miami. We arrived in Miami, and now uh, I sleep on the plane, on the plane. And uh, and when I wake up, he was in front of me, like a two or three, uh, two or three steps uh, in front of me. So I said, "Oh my God, this is not possible," you know. So I was trying to hide, to hide, you know. And so, <laughs> so he went out of the plane. And I was waiting for about five minutes, you know, a very good time, you know, to to let him go, you know. So when I went outside, he was there waiting for me. And I was like, oh, my God, it's not possible, you know. And he said, hey, man, how are you? How you doing? And I was like, I mean, I was shocked, you know, for a moment. I was like, hey, man, how you doing? How are you? Good, good, good to see you. And he was, hey, nice to meet you, you know. And, um... Uh, what you've been doing, and I like your method with Ray Mysterio. No, you, I, I, I think you're very talented, and uh, I just saw the last match that you have with Ray Mysterio, and that was that was great. That was hilarious, and I was like, oh my god, this guy is telling me that to me, and I was like, oh my god, you know what? This is a pleasure for me. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, thank you very much, and, and you know, you're the great one. I was trying to play it around, you know, and he said, no, man, you're the juice. <laughs> and, and you know that was really like a really 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 funny. He's a really respectful people and a really like a happy people. And uh, and then he said, you know, where are you coming from? And I was like coming from I don't know where. And he say and he say and did you say finally the juice has come back? And I was like, no man, I didn't. I, I didn't. I, that was not my intention. You know, I don't want to do that anymore. And he said, you know, don't worry about it. I like it. I think that's entertainment. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, thank you, and, and thank you, and, uh, you know, bye, bye, this, and this. And that was really, that was really funny, you know. Hey, let's go to a Todd in New York. Todd, you're next up with Hoobie. What's up, Dave, Brian? Hey. Um, hey, Hoobie Juice, how's it going, man? How's it going, man? Pretty good, thank um, you. I, I got two questions for you. Um, I'm a big fan of yours, by the way. I hope to see you back uh, sometime soon. Um. First of all, I was wondering what you thought of the WCW racial discrimination suit. Obviously, I mean, I don't want you to like burn any bridges or any uh, bridges or anything, but just sort of the general validity of you know what some of the luchadors and uh, some other wrestlers in the company think. The Sonny Ono thing. Um, I mean, basically uh, about the other guys. I don't know, man. I think, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's it's really difficult to answer that question because. I don't know why, you know. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I don't know why. I mean, maybe because I, I realize maybe because of the politics, you know, basically. Do you, I mean, do you feel like, do you feel like that the guys were held back, um, for racial reasons, or do you think that it's just one of those things where the bookers just really didn't have an idea of what to do with them and then, and that held them back? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, maybe, Maybe both things, you know, maybe both things, but you never know. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't want to talk, but I don't want to talk bad about uh, the people, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, 
you know, everybody, everybody got a different point of view. And, uh, well, just my point of view is to, to, they got really a lot of troubles, you know, to get over here in, in the United States. And that was because different, different reasons, you know, one was the English, second was the psychology, and maybe the third one was, uh, the politics, you know, and, and, and in the politics, you can, you can get involved a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things, you know. Okay, yeah, and um, uh, the other question I had was, what what um, period have you most enjoyed in your career? I mean, of course, you were with AAA for a long time, you know, Pomo's tackle with Conan, and then, you know, through ECW and WCW, you've really been in a lot of places. Like, what, what experience have you enjoyed the most? Well, <clears throat> Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Uh, I was saying to I really enjoy every every everything, you know, I really enjoy it when I play. And but basically most of what easy view but not the guys remember Uh Hoovy, your your phone's like dying. Oh really? Yeah. You're, you're, we're only getting like a little bit of what you're saying. Okay, so what I was saying is to basically I enjoyed everything, you know, triple A, E C W and also W C W. You know, I think um, in everyone I got a little bit of um, good memories. You know, everything was good, really, and I got really good memories for every, for everyone. Okay, well, best of luck to you, Hubi. Uh, Dave, quick question: um, Did you get my sure. email yesterday regarding um, the uh, the last show that uh, didn't sell out? Yes, you saved me because you know what? Everybody, including me, I looked it up, and 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 several other people emailed me. And had that uh, the last one that didn't sell out was uh, Calgary Stampede in '97, and then I got your email and I checked it out and you know you had the Charlotte show last year, which which in fact was the last one to sell out. And if you hadn't sent me that, I would I would I would have I, I, I was I actually had written all this stuff about the Calgary Stampede show this morning before I got your email. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I just I wanted to make sure you got it because like I, I dig, dug through my observers and tried to find it there. Anyway, uh, yeah. enjoy the show. Thanks very uh, thanks very much for that because you you uh, you caught one that like nobody caught. <laughs> oh, it's no problem there. <laughs> All right, yeah. take care. <laughs> okay, thanks a bunch, Todd. I want to ask you, uh, Hoovy, about uh, what's your thoughts as far as uh, Eric Bischoff perhaps running the company again? You know, you worked under Eric Bischoff and you worked for the company without Eric Bischoff. And yeah. Any thoughts on, on your relationship with Eric or what your thoughts are of, of how he would view what happened and do you think he'd be willing to take you back? You know, I really don't know about that, but uh, I... I, I... I used to really have a, I can say maybe a good relationship, a good relationship with him. But uh, you know, you never know. He's kind of strange, but uh, he's still a good people. You know, just I mean, he got a lot of discussion with a lot of different people. You know, and um, you know, I mean, for me, it's like um, he helped me, but you never know how much he wants to help you. You know, and so. Maybe he can hire me, hire me, you know, maybe not, but I, I don't really, I mean, that is not my point, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, everybody got a different point of view of, of him, and for me, it's just like a little bit, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, basically, he used to support most, most of the time to the big names, and, well, you know, I mean, he, if he is really a, a businessman or really, uh, I think he is, you know, he can realize what is the most important thing for, for the company, you know, and all depends what if he, what if he want to do now. Also, real quick, um, I want to throw two names by you. One I know you know very well, another I don't know if you do, but somebody asked about this. Um, everything that's happened, you know, you grew up kind of like, I guess, watching Jushin Liger with his matches in Japan, and then you finally got to wrestle him. He even got his belt, although he didn't bring the belt to the ring. And then, and that match was the match that you broke your elbow. And I know that, like, you were real upset with him for not catching you. I mean, have you talked to him at all in the last year or so? Or is it just kind of like he left and you kind of never really resolved it? You know, I mean, it's, it was really strange for me because, you know, I used to watch him, you know. I used to uh, see his videos and everything, you know. I used to have a lot of respect for him. And so when I was doing the match, you know, he was he was there, you know, he was, you know, uh, putting attention in everything, and 
And I said, you know, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this fly out so I can do catch me. And she said, yeah. And I realized he will, you know. And so I, when I did it, I fly too high, really too high, you know, just uh, just to to break my own fault, you know. I just put my all my trust in him, and I got a little bit afraid because he saw me so high. Oh, because he just moved at the last minute, you know, he moved, and I see that again, uh, one time, and I was like, I mean, he just moved, you know, for in one second, and in, in, that, in that second, I was in the floor already. So after the match, he said, you know, just, I'm sorry, man, I, I'm sorry, and, and I'm sorry, you know, he never said nothing about it, why he did it, or why he didn't catch me, or he didn't say nothing, he just said, I'm sorry, you know, and I, and I I realized maybe that was not intentionally, but um, but anyways, you know, I mean, well, uh, I just maybe lose a little bit of respect, you know, not in the way of what he does, you know, just in the way in 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 what he did in the match, you know. When uh, there's another wrestler, uh, I don't know if you've seen him or not, but somebody asked about him. Have you ever seen Shima Nobunaga? Actually, made him, he was in WCW for a little while, although he's gotten a lot better since then. Who's one of the Ultimo yeah. Dragons guys? Uh, no, no. no. I haven't Nothing. seen him in a while. No. Yeah. He's really gotten good. Yeah. yeah. I think I know who, I, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, he, he came in, uh, he was in WCW for a couple of shows and did some six man tags and then, you know, just kind of disappeared. I think that was Dragon's last match. Uh, the six-man tag? No, he had a, like, a singles match with Shima. Um, I don't remember, I remember him showing up. Um, I mean, I know he did, he, I, I, I know, I remember, like, he did a couple of matches. Um, I remember because he wrestled Jericho once, too. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, he started, the first one was a six-man tag. The reason is, is there was this match, it was the opener on a Nitro or a Thunder, I don't remember which one, and I had never heard of Shima Nobunaga, and... I don't think that I may have heard of Judo Su and Sumo Fuji, but they were as they were a trio against, and I don't remember who, but they had this spectacular match, and I was going like, "Who are these guys?" You know what I mean? You know, you when you have these guys that you've never heard of, and they're on Nitro, you you immediately think it's probably not going to be very good, let alone you know like that good. And then then it was one of those things like, I mean, these guys are good. And then it was yeah. like, well, we'll probably they'll, they'll never, probably never get another. Yeah, they'll be, they'll, be, they'll get buried next. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever have that feeling sometimes, like somebody would come in and have a good match, and um, you would just think, like, oh boy, you know, now they're not going to get a push. Yeah, I know, I know, I know what is that feeling, and I've been feeling that feeling for a lot, for many times. You know, you see one guy, and you say, maybe this guy is going to get good, he's going to get better, and you never see him again. You know. Yeah. Are there, are, um, well, let's, let's, have you have you wrestled for uh, Ultimate Pro before, or is this your first time? No, I wrestled the, the last month. The last month, I did a, I did a match with them. Yeah. Did you enjoy? I, I mean, how was the show and everything? I was good. You know, that was uh, really uh, kind of interesting. You know, because that was my uh, that was that was uh, that was like uh, uh, um. Like a royal little royal rumble, you know, with a cruiserweight guys, little uh, light guys, and mm -hmm. I, I did I did a running, and I was uh, and I was and I was beating, I was and I was beating everybody, and, and at the end I put over the hit the hit champions, you know, so you know that was, that was kind of interesting. Do you know uh, Chris Daniels? Chris Daniels? Mm, he, he, I think so. Yeah, well, I mean, no. have you have you seen him wrestle or anything? No, not at all. Okay, like he'll be. He's, I know he's on the show. He's. I think he's their champion. Brian okay. Chris, is Daniels is their UPW champion. Uh, mm -hmm. last time I checked, he was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he is. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go to. Let's go yeah. to Chris in uh, Long Island. Chris, what's going on? Hey, how's it going? Um, he he kind of answered this before, but this is one of the questions I had. I guess obviously there's then he's okay with the Rock. There's no heat there from his uh like mocking the Rock on on Nitro and Thunder. There's no problems there between him and the Rock. Oh, The Rock was like, he laughed about it, didn't he? He laughed about it, okay. Because I haven't heard all the show. I only caught some of it, and so I don't want to, you know, if I repeat anything you guys have already touched on, and I apologize. 
Yeah, yeah. Hoobie, he, he pretty much laughed about it, right? When you when you talked to him about, like, you know, you're doing finally, the juices come back yeah. and all that? So would he, uh, would he, if you if you were to go to WWF at some point, uh, does he think uh, something with The Rock would be done, at least, maybe not so much a, a program, but, uh, you know, something where he's mocking him and Rock kind of comes out and plays off of that and, and pretty much, I guess, and you know, buries Hoobie just as far as the interview goes, kind of like he does with everybody, but... Would he be up to doing something like that? Is it something he's like looking forward to doing if he were to get there? Is do a little something with The Rock based on the way he used to mock him in WCW? So I think that could be really, actually really entertaining if they did that. I don't know. I, I have some ideas when you bring that up. Did, uh, did you hear all that, Hoobie? Yeah. Any any thoughts about that? I mean, it just... I think it depends about WWF, what, you want, what they want to do with me. And what is the idea that they want to do with me? And I mean, in my mind, do whatever, you know. I think um, uh, the most important is to be entertainment. It's to be entertainment for the people, you know. And um, and I mean, be with the rug, you know. It doesn't matter who, you know, or with who. Okay. Um, also, too, does he have? Uh, as far as if if you were to go there, the one difference between the WWF and and most of the promotions that Hoovy's probably worked in, the ropes are, a lot of Hoovy's moves are, are springboard moves, and their ropes really aren't, like, clips for that, not the type that, that he's been doing, at least not in the center of the ropes, because I noticed guys like Taco kind of have to go over to the, like, near the turnbuckle to do some of his moves, and a couple of times he first tried to do them, he, uh, he almost killed himself doing it. So uh, is that a concern of his? Of like, I mean, he wouldn't have to completely change his style or anything. It's not like he just lives off the springboard moves, but a lot of his moves... Um, Mm-hmm. You know, basically, uh, uh, you know, rely on that, and he probably won't be able to do some of them in the WWF. So, is that something he's thought about at all, or I mean, how would he maybe go, try and work around that the same way Taka did? Or, um, you know, basically, I don't. Um, sometimes I've been thinking about it, but it doesn't really bother me at all because I know I can do my thing. I know I can. Uh, the ropes are really a little bit higher, high than than WCW. But it, it, that doesn't matter, you know. The most to be entertaining is to to have good matches, you know. Oh, and no. I think I, and I think I can, you know. Oh no, absolutely. I know. I, I, I you're an, an incredible worker. I know. The, the first time I ever saw you work was actually in ECW. I think the first the, the match you had with Mysterio was the first time I ever saw him, and I saw those. And uh, I had just seen the matches with uh, Ray and Psychosis, and as soon as I saw the matches with Hoovy and, and and Ray, I thought, you know, and there's not a knock on Psychosis, but I thought Hoovy was was much better than Psychosis just from seeing him and I, th- I just thought the matches were much better and so I was really? wondering why that you know the, the Psychosis Ray feud was hyped so much as this incredible thing which it was but I was wondering why I'd never heard of Hoovy over here in the States and I just was I was very impressed the first time I ever saw him and I think you're just a, an incredible worker so I hope wherever you do end up I hope they utilize you the right way that's the one fear WDF doesn't really have a track record of uh, pushing small guys and small uh, like you know Latino wrestlers they but with being that your personality, they might actually do something with you, and that you have the charisma to, to work around that. I really hope they do. If they do pick you up, there's there's always a way. If you really want it, you know, there's a oh, way. Yeah. There's a way. Anyone that's that talented, there's a way to get them over. The idea that you can't. I, it's a question of you don't want. Yeah, not, well, you don't, don't want, want to, to, but or yeah, it, it's, the, it's not so much not want to yeah. as much as the mentality is just kind of not there. You know, like this. Some people have this idea, and it's just like this equates this, and it's like small guy equates someone on the bottom and it's like if you're you know a little bit more creative you can find ways to I'm not saying like small guy is going to main event Wrestlemania right but uh, but there's things that you can do to make them a very entertaining part of the show especially because they they wrestle different you know Hoobie wrestles differently than almost anyone in the WWF in fact pretty much anyone right so and it's always good to have something different on the show rather than when every match is the same or you know you know, you want a variety Look that's, that's what makes a good show lose Crash Holly in the shuffle yeah yeah, they still don't like they know they 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 got some good ideas with Crash Holly, but then when they're in between good ideas, they have no idea. You know what I mean? It's like all they but all they tried like the only time they've ever other than when that was still comedy too. But the only time they ever tried to push guys like Kai and Ty was really when they they would do comedy. You know, make them like you know the the, the skits yeah the, the Japanese with comedy the yeah. going out drinking with them and make them like the goofy little Japanese guys. And I mean, and, and to some extent that is entertaining if you do it the right way, I guess. And and there's comedy that they can do with that, and, and, and it's good. But there's got to be a way of getting the not just the small guys, but just the foreign wrestlers in general, even the ones that don't speak English, you know, without being that stereotypical like Japanese American hating heel or 
or the the typical uh you know, like Eddie Guerrero character that they that they have out there now and that, that WCW tried to push off. I you know, I mean I I think there's gotta be ways and I just I would just like to see it. If if they ever got guys over like just try to, to bring in a guy like say I don't know Kobashi, and just see if they could do something with. Well, that's totally him. different. Uh, Kobashi's actually he's a really different. big guy. Uh, I know he's a big guy, but I mean, but being I don't I don't think he speaks English or anything. If he does, it's probably broken English. But you know, other than like sticking him with the Mr. Fuji and having him just come out and rip on America or something, I mean, I was just always I would just love to see one day if somebody could just get him over somehow where it wasn't just based on you know the obvious, you know and see if they could ever mix things up like that and, and just try something different for a change. Well, you know what it is? It's, it's, it's writers. Yeah, the thing with the writers that they have now is that the writers, you know, their, their version of wrestling is the WWF, mm -hmm. you know, because that's what they know. So they learn, so, that, so they're writing based on WWF knowledge that they have combined with knowledge of comedy from the television shows they've written. Right. So you don't have, I mean, it's like if, if you had a writer who, like, I mean, Bob Mould would have actually been an interesting one. He worked for WCW for a while, but never really had a lot of input. I mean, he was like a big-time Japanese wrestling fan, so he probably would have the mentality, okay, this worked in Japan, so maybe we can make it work in the States, whereas most of the people who didn't, you know, weren't, had never been to Japan or didn't study Japan, when they see a small guy, it's just one of those things where, well, he's too small, we put him, you know, we put him in the ring with one of the big guys, and it's, it's a hard match to take serious, and then you just kind of don't have... It's tough. You know, yeah. you... It's going to take it's going to take a it's going to take a, a booker and a writer who has just decided I'm getting it over and, and they will get it over when they decide they will rather than someone who's like okay I've got all these guys and they tell me to push them but I don't know how and I'll put them in this division and you know like not emphasize the division and then you become it becomes self fulfilling prophecy. Okay, uh, one question I had about uh, Raw and just the WWE in general, if I could. The this, on last night's show they were. Pushing all these injuries, the Al Snow thing with the cinder block, the China pile driver and everything, do you think they're maybe, like, or subconsciously trying to make up for the whole Triple H the car thing? Just that, since that was so, like, since that was done so poorly and just was so insulting to everybody, and even Triple H, too, supposedly has herniated discs and he's in traction now, but meanwhile the car thing didn't put him in traction, but this Hell in the Cell match put him in traction. Do you think they're just trying to maybe get around the car thing and just go, just level things off again so that people are back to, so they, so maybe they realized that by by them not selling the car <laughs> I, think they, drop, I think they overdid it. No. I think they did too. I was I was gonna I was thinking the same thing because I mean they've used the well I think it was only on big shows so that might not count but I know they did the cinder block thing before and just seeing a cinder block break over somebody's head is kind of unrealistic because it is without them their face being smashed in but I think maybe they realized when they did that since they caught so much flack for it that it was going to be hard for them to ever do any kind of angles where. You know, putting anybody over like it's just hurting somebody, like the spike pile driver on, on China. And, I mean, and she's a woman, so it's a little different. So they might think there's a little more believability in that. But it's going to be hard to get those typical like wrestling storylines over where these guys beat this guy up and took him out, and he's out for a week or two weeks or whatever. That they they may feel they're not, not going to be able to do that anymore because Triple H came out of everything looking like Superman. You know, well, if you want to get everything over, the point is to not do anything for a long time before you do something. Mm -hmm. And then you make a big deal out of it rather than do it six times in one show. Yeah, I, I think that. But I think that. Times last night that, that it just meant nothing. But that's well, that's kind of the way they do things now. Everything is so rushed; they don't take time for things anymore. Just in general, not just the WF, but I mean, I, I don't think they would take the time to do that and hope we forgot about it. I think they were just doing it and hoping well, to shove it down our throats so that we realize, hey, wow, look at these guys get hurt. I think they were doing it more for a storyline for Mick Foley. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, I mean, that, you know, for Mick Foley because Mick Foley's going to be taking time off. So I think that's that's the storyline is more than the idea of we're trying to make up for the. I don't think that the making up for the Triple H thing even entered anyone's mind because mm -hmm. I think that they just they kind of felt that okay, we need to have a whole bunch of guys hurt to make the storyline work, and so they just they just had a whole bunch of guys hurt all in one show. That's the whole thing hurt. Um, I, I think I emailed you about this a few days ago. I think the whole that just that car thing alone kind of hurt. I mean, it didn't really hurt just to me and to some of the fans. It, it kind of hurt the way they were trying to sell that cell match as being so dangerous because if 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 we couldn't see a guy get seriously injured from the car fall, then what were we to think was going to happen to anybody, especially Triple H being a guy that survived the car, in that match that was going to hurt them or bring them near death or in their career? Or, you know what I mean, all the things they were trying to sell about the match. And and plus, I mean, I know they were selling the fact that all the injuries, uh, all the bumps that Triple that, uh HBK and, and Foley took in their other matches led to the shortening of their careers. 
But the cell match that ended Fuller's career was based on a stipulation, not just the injury. It's not yeah. like they sold that he had to retire because of the bump he took, or that. Um, and and, and you, you know, do you know what I'm saying? As far as like, I, I do know. I do know what you're saying. They're they're almost assuming, they're almost assuming too much knowledge because, um, you know, Sean's career didn't end in the Hell in the Cell. Yeah. Uh, um, but you know, I, I don't know if it shortened it or not. It probably didn't lengthen it. That's right. for sure. And it's. As far as Foley, I mean, the one thing with that match, the famous match that he had in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. is, I mean, he was he was hurt real bad. Right. You know, oh, and, and everyone right. and everyone knows. I mean, everyone knows he was hurt real bad. Right. But they. Um, I love how they've rewritten history in what order the bumps took place. Yeah, yeah. I was just that's exactly. Everybody was saying that. that. Yeah. I, I, I said the that the 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 through the cage bump happened first, and then he says I brought him back up to the top of the cage and I threw him off through the table, and I was like sitting there just thinking, how can Every you? And that's one match. I mean, you can go back to other matches, like the time Foley and Shawn Michaels were talking about their match that nobody remembers. There's certain matches you could do that and get it away, get away with it. Other that's yeah, that's the match. one match you couldn't. But that's the one match you couldn't, really, because that, that's the one match that everybody, whether they're a smart or mark or whatever, everybody knows that match. I mean, that's the one. Yeah, the one thing is, maybe Undertaker just forgot. He might have forgot, but what? I mean, that was pre-taped, too. This is but that's, like that's, a pre, that's, a, that's a, that's a pre-tape that they, they could have stopped it. And, yeah. I, I, you know, you're, you're totally right on that, because... Because you know that well, the thing with that match is there's really only three moves in that match. He yeah. went, he went off the top, he went through the cage, and he he got slammed on the thumbtacks. Yeah. And and nobody remembers anything else because there really wasn't anything else in yeah. that match. Not really. And and everyone has if you didn't watch that match live, the fact is everyone has seen a videotape of it, whether it's in um, Beyond yeah. the Matter, whether it's on 2020, or where it's been on WWF TV 500,000 times. That's the one match where everyone knows those three bumps in order. And again, because the key, the whole thing to the match too was after he took that first bump off the cage, and everybody thought the match was over, and they were taking him out on the stretcher. They either thought it was legitimately over, or they were just going to sell it that it was over. Then he came back up and climbed back up, and that was that whole that huge pop that he got from the crowd for for getting off the stretcher after everybody thought he was dead or, or, or not going to be able to wrestle anymore. And that whole thing, that's why it was so fresh in everybody's mind too, because it was so shocking that it was so early, and then. The, the rest of the match was built on the fact that this didn't even stop him, you know what I mean? So I was just kind of like, especially because it was a pre-tape. If Undertaker forgot, so be it, you know, but if they could have said, cut, hold on, let's just reverse that yeah, or just they, splice yeah, they should have. do something, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's, the, that's yeah. not the kind of mistake they usually make. Who, you know, what was your, what's your thoughts on matches like that? I mean, like uh, the real crazy bump off the top of a cage 15 feet, you know, I mean, it's, what, what, do, you, what do you think of all that? I mean, you've never really done anything... I mean, your stuff is more spectacular moves in the ring and spectacular dives out of the ring rather than falling from 20 feet. Well, you know what? I used to do a lot of crazy shit like that. Well, not exactly like that, but uh, in cage, you know, in Mexico, and uh, well, you know, there's some points that you don't that you don't even care about what you're doing, you know. And I know Mick Foley, you know, he's just like a crazy motherfucker, just like everyone about, you know. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, it's just one of those guys who they don't care, you know, and they just want to do the most crazy thing to they, want, to they can, you know. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's just really, really strange, but it's, at the same time it's really exciting, you know, and it's one of the most memorial things for the wrestling fans, you know, in this moment, at this time. Yeah, it is. It is. It's memorable. Well, you were in Los Angeles in that cage match about, was it four or five years ago, with all that stuff coming off the top of the cage. Remember, do you remember that match? Is the sports arena in L.A. like a? It was a different uh, kind of cage, like a star. Was it star cage or something? Star of death. Uh, um, I don't remember very really well. That was in L.A. You say? Yeah, it was like the last t time probably you read Triple A came to L.A. I think. Um, yeah, I think I remember now. Yeah, I mean that was just one of those things, you know, really crazy, and uh, it just depends what is your moment, you know, what you want to do, or, or what is the expectation. For uh, for the people, you know, in that moment, you know, and, and so it's, I can tell, you know, it's really exciting even, even for us, you know, it's really exciting for us doing that crazy, crazy things, you know. What, what do you think, how far do you think you can go safely, you know, doing, you know, doing something, uh, has there ever been anything where that you've done it and then afterwards you've gone, oh my God, that wasn't yeah. very safe now that I think back on it? Um, you know, I mean, every everything is different, you know, and maybe I don't want to, I mean, even, even if I saw like a one bomb like a couple of years ago and I said I don't want to do it again, maybe in the next year I get the opportunity to do some something more crazy than that and I will do it, you know.
and I will do it because that's because because that's my job and that's what I love, you know, and that's what I love to do. Hey, Chris, Chris, anything else? Um, yes, yeah, I can ask well, again. Well, 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 with the broad part guy, and then you can go. Okay. Um. Uh. I don't know if this was touched on earlier again. Like I said, I couldn't hear the show, but uh. Was Hoovy while he was in WCW? Was he ever um, by any of the people that you know that had power, you know, the, the Nashes or the Hogans or whatever? Was he ever like directly kind of um, made aware of the fact that they were going to to hold him back? Or that you know, were they ever? Was it, was they don't. They don't, they don't. Were they ever like? I mean, they don't tell. They don't tell you. You just sort of. You but, sort I, of just well, learn maybe it. not not with them directly, but like kind of like that whole Vanilla Midget story that he would say about Malenko and Benoit. Were there ever things that he knew that? Well, was it that, you know, was he lucky because he was friends with guys like Conan and Mysterio and they were kind of friends with Nash, so that's one of the reasons that those guys were given a break and weren't um, as, at, you know, treated the same way that the other luchadors like uh, La Parker and so on were, that, you know, that he was actually given somewhat of a chance maybe because for whatever reason Nash was friends with, with, with Ray and everybody, or mm-hmm. did he ever get the feeling, you know, that, that he knew he was being held back, especially when he'd have those great matches with Kidman and guys and it would just be squashed. I mean, what were, were, yeah, what were, it's like, I mean, was there ever anything where, where guys would come up to you and go, my God, you know, you're really being held back? Or was it just kind of like you, you just kind of had that frustration because you were having good matches and you weren't, you know, you weren't going any further? You know, I mean, uh, whatever happened in the company, you you know what is, what is going, going on, you know, because you're in the locker room, you're uh, outside of the locker room, but you know what's going on, you know, and so you know, Frustrating sometimes, but it's it's depending about you, you know how 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 you want to see it, you know, and how happy you want to be. And it's you know it's just it's 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 difficult, you know, but it's at the same time it's funny, you know. It doesn't matter, you know. It's just um, well, you know, you never know. Sometimes it's you you say, fuck, you know, why this guy is happening to me, you know, or why this guy they got a lot of power, or why we don't have that power, you know. But it's just all depend on circumstances, you know, and I mean, it's, it's just timing, maybe, you know, for everybody. Brian, you got real quick question because we got we got to run right in a second. Okay. okay, we are totally out of time right now. Hubie, I want to thank you very, very much for doing the show. We finally got to do it, and uh, I'll be seeing you on the twentieth when we go back down there, and uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow at six. We're gonna have Tom Zink on. <laughs>